Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, fellow South Africans, and a special greeting to our hosts, the South African Chamber of Commerce here in the UK, represented here by our colleagues, Sharon and Amanda. It is always said to see your members of your community leave, but ancient people always thought that when your relatives leave and they go to live in another village, you now have more relatives. So we come here as fellow South Africans under the leadership of Professor Vim de Villiers, seated there, <coughs> who is leading Stellenbosch University. I also would like to acknowledge the colleagues that are with us. Colleague, Karen Bruns, Darren Havinger, and of course, my old team member, Emil Heiko. As I've indicated, it is said to see people go, but it is nice to know that you now have a relative in a different community. In other words, you're not losing, you're, you're becoming a more extended community. I was asked to address you today on why social justice, what is social justice and why social justice? Of course, we put a scary subtitle there that says we ignore social justice at our peril, but I want us to maybe just go easy on that subtitle Instead, look at having a social justice <coughs> conversation as part of building bridges of hope. That change of mind from scaring you about why we should get involved in social justice to building bridges of hope came from a video that my colleague Karen sent to us last Thursday, and I would encourage you to watch it. It is based on the Ripples of Hope trip that was undertaken by Robert Kennedy around 1963. And during that trip, he also was asked by Stellenbosch people to come and address them. And of course, you will agree with me that those who, invest, those who invited Bobby Kennedy to come and speak at Stellenbosch University wanted to engage. And you want to engage when you are inspired by hope that maybe something meaningful can come out of this engagement. And indeed, his own trip was called Ripples of Hope. Of course, we know that sadly, he was killed a few years thereafter. But history has taught us that people can be killed for their ideas. But the ideas live on. We're meeting at a time when we're living through a paradoxic democracy. My slide here says the paradox of our democracy. And as I was preparing for this, I looked at Charles Dickens again. That first chapter about it was um, the best of times and the worst of times. And 
it was both a period of foolishness and wisdom, hope and despair coexisted. And this was around the beginning of the French Revolution, where there were also ructions here in, in the why is our democracy paradoxical? When an American judge was asked which democracy would you recommend for the Egyptians to rebuild their country after the Arab Spring, Ruth Bader Ginsberg, his answer was, don't look to America, look to South Africa. They have the best of constitutions. And indeed, if you read some of the articles that I've written, I have extolled the virtues of our constitution. It has a very clear vision of what kind of society we're trying to build. It has very clear provisions around what character of government will be required to build this country. The vision, as you, as you may recall, is in the Constitution. The preamble talks about we adopt it in order to establish a, a society that is founded on democratic values, social justice, and fundamental human rights, where every citizen's life is improved and every person's potential is freed. It also talks about what would be the basic entitlements of the people, which are human rights in chapter two. And this include your normal civil and political rights, but also basic rights such as the right to access to food, water, uh, health services, education, social security, etc. It's very clear that the state must be ethical and you will find provisions about the requirement of ethical underpinnings of the state in section 96, talking about the executive, national executive, section 136, dealing with the provincial executives, and 195, dealing with everyone who works, from, who works for the state or within state affairs from a cleaner to the president. And Section 195 does not end with ethics. It has basically all of the requirements of good governance. You know the UN identifies eight characteristics of good governance. You'll find all of them the participatory, consensus-driven, responsive, efficient, effective, inclusive, and equitable. All of them and of course, based on the rule of law. It also provides a series of structures for accountability. We say we have a polycentric accountability framework. And at the time we introduced that accountability framework, it was innovative because the traditional democratic architecture is three arms of government. Incidentally, some people still write as if we only have three arms of government in South Africa. But that architecture was disrupted by including chapter nine of the constitution. And Nelson Mandela said at a public protector stroke ombudsman conference in 2000, even the most benevolent of governments have within them persons with propensities for human failings. And, and then he explained that that's why we've had this kind of architecture for the state to ensure that the people are never without a remedy when government has misbehaved or their rights have been violated. The state is meant to be based on the rule of law, which means nobody is above the law. And 
lastly, there's also the independence of the judiciary and the media. All of these are part of the polycentric accountability framework. Because of the democratic nature of our state, where democracy is mentioned in the constitution no less than 27 times, the people are built into the constitution. They built into the democracy. So they're not just supposed to be consumers of democracy. They're supposed to be participating in the democracy. And provisions in the constitution make it clear that ours should be a, a participatory democracy. Where's the paradox? Celebrated globally, but the reality is some of you are here because you feel the economy is underperforming. And with COVID-19, the, the breaks have become even more severe. But for others, it's worse than an underperforming economy. Unemployment, unofficial unemployment is at over 45%. That is official unemployment at about 36% plus needs those not in employment education and training. Poverty at 55%, disaggregated to 1% among those classified as white, 6% among those classified as Asian and Indian, 38% among those classified as colored or mixed race, and 62.4%, rather 64.2% among those classified as African, which is indigenous Africans. And COVID-19 has knocked the GDP and also impacted very negatively people's livelihoods. But that's not all. The Gini coefficient is one of the highest in the world at 0.69, which is almost 70% understanding that in a, new, in a European society, the Gini coefficient should be zero. And I was listening to a German professor complaining that the Gini coefficient is at about 3% and that's very dangerous. And I was saying, oh my good Lord, <laughs> if 3%, if 0 0.3 is dangerous, what is 6%? What is 0.69 or 69 percent? So this is, it does look bad, but during COVID-19, we also know that there are companies that did well. For example, Old Mutual just posted 65 percent profits during COVID-19. A company that sponsored us when we submitted our last summit in Kilimanjaro also posted quite, that is Northam, posted quite lucrative profit. But there seems to be two parallel worlds, and COVID 19 has exacerbated the problem. If you asked young people that I met on Saturday, there's another issue you'd have to add violence, particularly gender-based violence. A lot of them were saying one of the reasons they enjoy being in this country is that they can walk anywhere, anytime. And, and in our country, it's increasingly difficult to do so unless you live in Slavenbosch or some other place, and, or some other social bubble. I suppose, you know, statistics can be scary. And I don't want to leave you with the impression that it's a country that has become ungovernable and everything is falling apart. These are figures. One thing I have discovered 
by accident and initially annoyed is that today is better than yesterday. And I know if any of you have read the book, Factitude. So if you read the book Factitude, at first as a social justice person, you will be annoyed and say this person is making the point of the troubles of the world. <coughs> but just think about it, if somebody like Olive Schreiner or Charlotte McCoyagin or Pixley, Aseme, or Bayes Nodi woke up and found us sitting like this in the room, to them this would be like huge progress because they lived at a different time when um, this debasement of certain groups, women, um, black people, people with disabilities. <coughs> so every time when, when we talk about that constitution, we can at least say that it's legal equality and there's political leverage for all of us. So, but why should we care about social justice? Firstly, we have to agree what is social justice. Just think about it. What does social justice mean to you? Most people, when they define social justice, they start with these words. There is no agreement on what social justice is. And I think that's dismissive because there's no agreement on what justice is. But we don't start with that disclaimer when we talk about justice. So when you start with a disclaimer on something, you're already saying to your audience, dismiss this unintentionally. So what is social justice? At the social justice chair, we have worked out our own definition that says social justice refers to just, equitable, and fair distribution of all opportunities, resources, benefits, privileges, and burdens in a society. It is part of equal enjoyment of all rights and freedoms by everyone. And at the core of that is embracing the humanity of everyone. That's a very long definition of social justice. The best definition of social justice comes from John Rawls, 1971, A Theory of Justice, where he basically says, Social justice is justice, because justice is fairness to all. That's why we have the scale of justice, it's about balance. And the social justice, the difference between justice and social justice is that social justice is a form of justice that is about fairness between groups. So it could be a fairness between heterosexuals and gender divergent groups. It could be between rich and poor, nationals and non-nationals, blacks and white, women and men. It also covers intersectionality, <laughs> where some of the groups may be LGBTQI, non-national or refugee, um, disabled and poor, all of these things in one. We talk about those who exist at the intersection of different identities that tend to be debased and excluded from life. So, so social justice is about fairness to all. And then the theory, why is social justice? John Rawls is one of those who believes that social justice is natural. It's human nature to want to live in a fair society. And this has been proven. When I attended Young One World, 
for the first time, George, I mean, Bob Geldof told a story about monkeys. One set of monkeys was given, one monkey was given cucumbers for doing its work. And, and it did its work diligently because he thought that was what people get as a reward when they do a good job. Until one day, they lifted a veil and it so that next door there's another monkey. They still gave both monkeys, monkey A and B, the same job to do. And when it came to rewards, monkey B was given grapes, which is a favorite for this kind of monkey. And um, we think monkeys like peanuts. <laughs> this particular kind of monkey <laughs> loves grapes. So when monkey B got grapes, monkey A thought the reward system had changed and it started salivating and expecting to get grapes. And it got cucumbers. The monkey got angry, became belligerent, threw out the grapes and refused to work. So what does this mean? It means unfairness not only undermines productivity in a society, but it is also a source of conflict. When the world first em embraced the concept of social justice, it was about the conflict between labor and capital. This was 1843, when Italian Jesuit scholar Luigi Tapparelli came up with the concept. This is after the first Industrial Revolution. And it was really just about fair rewards, which John Rawls, for example, talks about. If you're all working in the same company, of course, those who work with their brains tend to be paid more. And those who both work with their brains and have invested money tend to be paid more. But he asked the question about what is fair? What differentiation is fair in the second? Can, for example, 1 to 70 be fair? But that's not really what I'm going to focus on. I'm just giving you an example of what the, the notion of fairness is. So when the world, though, embraced it, it was because that unfairness was causing conflict, not just in the labor force, but in society. Then the First World War happened. It was attributed to social injustice. And as a result, as part of the solution, they had the Treaty of Versailles in 1990. But clearly, they didn't resolve issues properly because German workers found, found themselves paying for the sins of the German middle class and suffering and therefore 1945 happened excuse me the author of going big says america could have gone the same way fascist if franklin d roosevelt had not come up with interventions to reduce the gap and particularly to ensure that everyone enjoyed freedom from want. And those of us in this room who've done a bit of psychology, you would know that in the hierarchy of needs, hunger is extremely important. <coughs> And before people start being thinking ethically and and think about sex, um, self actualization, they need to meet those basic needs. So that's what he did. But he also 
began the thinking that led to the Marshall Plan, which is my next issue. So wh why should we, you be concerned, you, you and I be concerned? Number one, it's the issue of peace, is the Treaty of Versailles says, the, um, the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights also uh, puts justice and peace as um, pieces of a puzzle that have to work together. The Copenhagen Declaration of 1995 that mentions social justice specifically also links it to peace. So links social justice and human rights to peace. And then when the UN declared February 20, the Social Justice Day in 2017, it also linked it to peace. And every year when they talk about social justice on February 20, they link social justice to peace. So it's a natural thing, it's part of, but as business people, I know that what is also important is like, does it make business sense? And there, I've got a picture here of the Rugby World Cup team that won the World Cup in 2019. And what does that tell us? It tells us that when you leverage ecosystem advantage, you will do better. And one of the examples, it's a global, it's a real life story where a farmer that I've renamed Farmer Brown because in South Africa we had Farmer Brown at some stage. So um, when this Farmer Brown was asked, why do you win this competition? He said, it's easy. I give my best seeds to my neighbors. And the journalist, like some of, her, some of them in this room asked, why would you do that? That's silly. These are your competitors. And Farmer Brown says, much as they are my competitors, they're also part of my ecosystem. If their bed seed yields weak crops, the birds, the winds, and the bees that cross-pollinate are going to cross-pollinate their weak crops into my crops and therefore I will not do well. I do so to make sure that ultimately I win because I'm the best farmer, not because my neighbors have a disadvantage. But I also know that if my neighbors have a disadvantage, <coughs> I would end up suffering because of the weaknesses in the ecosystem. But what does this mean in a real system? South Africa is a structurally weak country because it doesn't function on all cylinders. I started now with statistics that say that nearly half the people are unemployed. But Stats SA is saying youth unemployment is at about 70%. So that's where your innovation your energy is, and it's like having your rugby team and having Franca Pinaya and all of them being the only ones that are fighting for it. It's, um, it's possible. I know some American football has just decided to go back to the field at 45. That's fine. But then you have all of your young people, the majority of them uh, are sitting on the bench. In South Africa, I told you white unemployment is at 1%. But sadly, white people make less than 10% of the population, which means majority of your population is sitting idle. And this is why JFK came up with the, with the New Deal. And then after the Second World War, um, America again came up with the Marshall Plan to help Europe to bring everyone together. 
So if you do agree with me that we do need a way of bringing everyone on board, from our side, we have come up with something we call a Musa plan for social justice. Musa means grace, but it's not a grace plan, it's just accidental that it's a grace plan. It's Musa because it's named after Palisa Musa, who is around the same age as I am, 60, I'm telling you, in a few days' time. He was, she was arrested at the age of 12 on June 16, 1976, and uh, tortured and ill-treated, and then at the end of the day, the entire life was derailed. That's Palisa Musa. Today, she works hard, just as I do. She goes to Cornhill to sell some cheap cosmetics, and but she remains poor. Oh, well, now the, the, the Tumor Foundation is helping her. But when we found her in 2017, she was poor. But that meant his son also could not go to university, which then means the cycle of poverty. Stellenbosch uh, has many initiatives around bridging the gap, not just the, the project bridging the gap, but one of the projects is AIMS, African Institute for Mathematical Science. And they bring in scientists for free. They, they, they bring in young mathematics students into university for free um, at master's level. Why do they do that? It's because Prof Chirov believes that, that's Ben Chirov's son, believes that the next Einstein might never be discovered if money becomes an obstacle. Our colleagues at Stellenbosch University, Karen Brun and Prof. Vim think all of these talents, we don't know the next Einstein, the next um, astronaut that's going to take us to the moon, the next Prof. Tulio, who will make sure that we do even better with the management of epidemics might be hiding somewhere among those students that get excluded because they're no longer able to pay fees. So other people say, oh no, but they failed. What we discovered after the SRC approached us with this thing with um, Prof. Sonia was you really never understand another person's case until you walk in their moccasins, as American Indians or American Native Americans say. Many of these students come from schools where they excelled because teachers helped them to do exam questions. And they thoroughly focused and focused on exam questions. And they, they worked very hard. But the ability to comprehend fully everything is something they're still just getting into, getting into. So when they come to university, often they don't do well. So they lose their scholarship, and then the university keeps them a little bit for a little bit longer, and then eventually the university says, uh, we need the fees. Because, of course, if the university doesn't get fees, uh, eventually it may be closed and nobody else can, uh, can be educated. So action for inclusion is one of the things that under the Musa plan for social justice, we decided to, to be involved in. The plan itself has only four pillars and you've got it in, uh, on your table. It's about leveraging social capital within civil society to accelerate progress in bridging the gap. The first one is just simply a policy level help government to design policies, laws, and programs better. At the chair, we talk about tailoring for all. It's really a new approach. It's not the same thing as just data-based, because you can plan your thing based on, based on data in terms of, let's say, I use data because I'm planning 
to make sure that uh, we combat COVID-19. It's all data-based. The tailoring for all, which is, uh, it's an additional thing, says, as I fix this one problem, who might be accidentally healed? For example, when government started managing COVID-19, we sent them a policy in, 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 in April 2020 to indicate that if you locking people down, those in the margins are going to fall off. If you're asking children to go and learn from home using data devices, many of them will not have them. Many of them will not have connectivity, etc. And of course, eventually government caught up, universities caught up, and they gave them data devices. But Salt Lake University had to recall them after a while because having given them data devices, having given them data, there was no connectivity. So what we're putting on the table, and there's a good response from government, is use this aggregated data at the level of planning. So it's sort of a new science that's leveraging data analytics to disaggregate your community before you implement something to see how is it going to affect older persons? Because it's not your intention to harm older persons, rural people, women, etc. Men, just to make sure that you're tailoring for all and you need to know who is everyone before you tailor for all. And um, we've come up with a, a social justice impact assessment instrument. So it's a predictive in, in impact assessment instrument. We also are getting into serious gaming. If you could help us to build a serious game. The team that's working on social justice impact assessment is interdisciplinary. It's got the data school, the data science school, the engineering um, group, and it's also working with German engineers and TUT engineers mathematicians, statisticians, etc., to get the data that tells us where is everyone, and then to build, because we're still looking at how do we build the model, because there has to be something behind it, and, and that's where we need assistance. We, we tried VW, uh, but that was the first one we tried, and we didn't get it. <coughs> but it was our German counterparts that applied, I don't know whether they did. The application was not as it could have been uh, to do the social justice explorer. And we've seen it works because German engineers built something called Plan A. It works according to the same principles. Any decision you're making in your company that seems like it's good for business, when you apply, when you play the game with Plan A, you realize that it might have negative implications on sustainability, not just sustainability for your company, sustainability for the entire ecosystem and sustainability for the environment. And we believe that if government had an instrument such as the ones we're trying to design from 1994, we wouldn't be where we are, where we have a constitution that says we're building a socially just country, and then we end up with the unpopular um, outcome of being the most unequal society in the world. And yet a whole lot of good things have been done. I mean, apart from corruption, we would agree with you that, that some of it has been about corruption, but a lot of it has to do with um, negative impact of policies with good intentions. The second part is social justice, uh, social accountability, and social cohesion. I need not tell you about how the country is increasingly becoming polarized. It was polarized before Belt Potinger, but Belt Potinger just worsened things. So it might be a gift in that it, it gives us an opportunity to do something about it. The difficulty is that time may be running out. We might not have until 2030. As we saw what happened in, in, in Guazulu Natal, hungry people tend to be angry, and as FRD predicted, 
it's easy to gaslight them into extremism, including fascism. The third one is leadership, activating leadership in society at all levels, which includes uh, building a capable state, civil society participating in building a capable state. And then the last one is financing this change. In the same way as the Marshall Plan, financing came from Americans. So our Marshall Plan is not going to come from Americans. So we're asking ourselves to put our hands in our own pocket. So we're not asking you, though, alone to do this. For example, just in conclusion, why do I personally do this? For me, building bridges of hope is a personal journey. I would have ended schooling at grade 10 if I, my mom had not applied for a scholarship, a bursary for grade 11 and 12, which I got initially from the Swazi Council of Churches, and um, which helps South African students. The second one was from the United Nations through John Daniel, who was um, president of NUSUS, kicked out of South Africa. But when he, he went to Switzerland, he decided that no South African student would be sent back because they don't have finance. So I, I got my first <coughs> United Nations scholarship. And my second scholarship was from somebody from Stellenbosch. They asked no dear. It was when I did my LLB. When I went to Harvard, still some strangers that I don't know paid for my, my, my fees. And I therefore feel that every time a child is about to be kicked out, I say, what if also the total strangers had left me alone? Where would I be? And these young ones that are being kicked out, or those who just don't make it at all, what talent are we losing in our ecosystem? But secondly, it is just an issue of Ubuntu. Ubuntu is understanding that I am because we are. Our lives are interconnected. My humanity is not more important than yours, and your humanity is not more important than mine. But more importantly, we are better together, which is what the rugby team says, ecosystem advantage, stronger together. When spider webs unite, they can type. Already just us being here together, we're becoming that spider web. Already you staying connected to South Africa and doing your best to connect the world to South Africa, the part of that spider web. Our difficulties may seem very hard, but Nelson Mandela said, after climbing a great hill, discover that there are many more hills to climb. I learned on Kilimanjaro that is the same thing. You summit one peak, and then there's another one to summit. And at some stage, you think it's impossible. I'm not going to make it. As Mandela said again, it often seems impossible until it's done. My view is we can do this, and we will do this. I've seen it happening at Stellenbosch University. I was expecting our VC to speak. I've seen him do it at the Stellenbosch University. It's one of the only universities with a restitution statement. It must not have been easy, but it was done. And you can see step by step the university changing. And I do think we don't have 10 years to fix South Africa. But if we can just start small, action for inclusion, and then a little bit of getting into the M plan, the, the policy part, 
the building the social cohesion and social accountability part. I think that in three to five years' time, that country will look different. Thank you. Well, firstly, that was amazing. I feel so inspired from having listened to you. And the last thing you were covering was um, your passion. I'm going to use your words, building your personal bridges of hope. I thought that's just such a lovely, passionate way to explain why you put so much of your personal time into what you were doing. And she talked about climbing Kilimanjaro. I went, oh, my goodness me, I worry about doing a marathon now and then. Um, it's somewhat challenging. So very, very uh, impressed. And Ubuntu is about what South Africa is so good at understanding as, as a nation. We work well together. But just in opening, uh, before we move over to the actual questions, um, it's one of the, the major contributions you made as public prosecutor with the writing of your book, State of Capture and Secure and Comfort, which I think was the, you talk about research and getting under the into the data, which is what you were talking about earlier, so that we now have information we didn't have before, which has spearheaded <coughs> a degree of um, insight and change into what is happening in South Africa. And hopefully we will be seeing something um, more concrete happening, which we'll talk about in a moment. The other thing I wanted to allude to is she talks I say she, sorry, that sounds awful. Julie talks about being like the uh, vendor spiritual female leader who whispers the truth to the ruler, the Makahadzi. And you listen to her. You can just imagine that spiritual leader. You are quite amazing and quite inspiring. And your knowledge and uh, presence is quite special. So thank you very much for being such a spiritual person as well as being a legal sharp mind. So we have both in one person. You talked about the story of the monkey and what I took from that is if business could just recognize what motivates people positively and negatively, and actually maybe even using your gaming plan A, we could actually get to understanding how we are going, how people are going to respond to certain circumstances. I think people live life out of HR departments, finance departments, etc. Often Excel spreadsheet. And I get seriously concerned because it doesn't work. So I enjoyed your monkey story because I think it told us a lot about ourselves as people. Um, your passion for the law. Can you share with us where did that start in you? Because it must have been pretty, pretty young. Thank you, Sharon. I I don't know when exactly it started, but when I look back, as Steve Jobs said, you connect the dots <laughs> back backwards. I think it is a combination of seeing female suffering and black suffering under the apartheid laws. Um, I would say female suffering because that's what I awoke to first and even wrote a play about it, where under the Black Administration Act, women would be thrown out of their homes when a husband passed because customary law had been distorted mm. to make them unable to possess, let alone own anything. And so I saw that happening. I also saw one day my dad tell my mom, to go back to Norway because her parents were gone by then. So she had to go to my aunt's place and ask my aunt to come and apologize for her. And so that was my sense of justice. And then, of course, under party, I lived in Sweden during the time when past laws were enforced ruthlessly by a certain caliber of police that were called blackjacks. They could kick the door anytime. And the doors were iron ones or steel doors. They made a lot of noise and they would kick them and grown-ups would hide under anything. So it was quite debasing. 
to see that. Uh, yeah, when I look back, I think that was that. But the crunch time came after June 16, before, because up until then, I had sort of um, leaned towards medicine because if you smart or if you pass well, math, science, teachers just push you towards medicine. So I think June 16, because I remember specifically turning my, um, my attention to law after that. Well, I think the medical profession has lost somebody really important. Thank goodness for South Africa, we got you in the law because it has made such a difference. One of the other sort of questions I'd like to ask, because I am very curious, is how did you how have you been able to balance what is right by law, what is right by ethics, what is right by your views of social justice, and how you've had to use that to influence government, public sector, change in the country. Maybe share a story or two with us. Right. Um, but just one little detail I forgot on the previous answer was that I think if my father had been to school, he would have been a lawyer. Mm -hmm. He had never seen an inside of the classroom, but he represented himself in court. Oh, really? And um, I don't know if you know the the... the the story about the lions that tell their story, that the lions must tell the story. This hunter was telling stories all the time and he was always winning the battles. So my dad, the way he told his stories about how he told of the magistrate, he always came across as a hero. Of course, I never <laughs> was in court. But it just, he told the magistrate that um, you, you can't... Um, it's wrong of you to arrest me for trading without a license because it's your government that's not giving me a license. I've got the money here. You should be arresting your government. So that was the story. <laughs> so that feistiness. And he spoke a lot about people like Mandela and Pixley Gassem, among other things. And I also had an opportunity to do a live case with Priscilla Jana which took young people off the death penalty when I was doing the first year. Um, That's amazing. So how do I deal with this? I, I honestly think I probably was influenced by Stewart versus Somerset, where the focus is on justice rather than law. Mm -hmm. And I taught my team as public protector based on my experience as a young lawyer who had been, because I did my first degree in Swaziland, so there was a lot of emphasis on justice and conscious, conscientizing us about the disparity <coughs> in the justice that ours is to try and ensure that justice gets done. As a public protector, we, we worked out a formula that wasn't ours, I think, ombudsman globally use it. What happened? What should happen? Mm -hmm. Is there a discrepancy? If, it's, if there's a discrepancy, is it, um, does it really amount to impropriety? Because there can be an explainable discrepancy, like in any other situation. And, and then if it, uh, it amounts to impropriety, who was harmed, and it could be one person, just a gogodlami, or the nation. So let's say with a gogodlami, for example, uh, one case that we had was a, I'm, I'm gonna, there are lawyers in this room, I think a lot of you might be lawyers. So the public data operates slightly different from judges in that it's proper conduct rather than legal conduct. So proper conduct sometimes is more, it could be lawful, but still unjust and right. still improper. So, well, I had the case where a soldier lost his house, his home, because the Department of Defense owed him money. And in law, they said the money had nothing to do with the house because they, they were not owing him money for the house. They were just owing him money, which 
they were suppo- they kept promising to pay and he kept promising the bank to pay them. There was a clear link, but not a legal link. Legal nexus. And our decision was that if the Department of Defense had acted properly, which is if you make a promise, you pay, and especially if, if if you make multiple promises and every time this person goes to the bank until eventually the bank sold the house and then the public protector powers in terms of the constitution are to investigate, report and take appropriate remedial action. And my interpretation or the team's interpretation was that appropriate means whatever is legitimate in the circumstances and appropriate here meant the Department of Defense must give him the house he lost. Mm -hmm. So at first they disagreed, but eventually they did. Initially they put him in an officer's mess. Eventually they did give him the house. So that's just one example. The other example is in Gantla. So I've given you a Google Lamini kind of story. The the Mr. or Miss Ordinary. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you so much. Yes. For those that are online, we have got one-hour slot, but we're going to be here a little bit longer because we are in person. So there is a recording of this event that will be available. So if people need to drop off, we totally understand, but you guys in the room, you're probably stuck a little few, few more minutes with us. If you do need to run, we do respect it, but I think we're going to continue. Just a few more minutes if we may. So the I was going to explain the Nganza one was another example where looking at what is just. Again, the normal principle of unjustified <coughs> was not squarely on because in unjustified enrichment, you must have a contract, you must have a paid person. But if you look at it, just the logic of unjustified enrichment, it was unjustified enrichment or improper enrichment. So we use that to say the president had to pay um, a reasonable amount of what he was enriched with in developing or uh, renovating his house. In Amazing stories and issues that you have had to solve. And I really do look forward to seeing some of these people in question brought to justice. Do you feel that will occur in the foreseeable future? given where the government and the country are now. And we've had the Zondo Commission since. <coughs> well, I think two weeks ago, mm-hmm. the NPA announced arrests and um, the, the person in charge, the, what do they call him? The independent, the investigation director, they call him, the, they call her the ID. She promised that there would be more arrests before the end of September. And therefore, I do think a lot is going to happen. But there's been accountability. In this country, you've applied the Magnesti, the Magnesky Act to hold the captors accountable. Their, their assets were frozen. I think it was Lord Peter Hain. Peter Hain. 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 <coughs> use that act meaningfully yes. and and there are many countries that apply that egg. So it's really when spider webs unite, I, mm-hmm. I do think that they will be accountable. And then there's a movement in the country that that has been established. It's called Defend Our Democracy. And it's also just pushing to make sure that nobody That is absolutely heartening to hear. And we look forward to seeing examples of that being played out. Um, how do you think the interrelationship role exists between law, journalists, educational institution, politics, to ensure a just and equitable society that you are so passionate about and you've done so much to forge it occurring? I think journalists have played an amazing role in so far as uh, combating corruption is an injustice because I do think corruption is an injustice and state capture as a form of corruption is a gross injustice. But it also corruption is social injustice because 
you have a group of people who are corrupt that get benefits that they shouldn't be getting. And then you get hardworking, honest people not getting what they deserve. And social justice is about everyone getting fairly, squarely what they deserve. So corruption is, is an injustice and journalists have really dealt with that. Where I think journalists need to do more is social justice, educating our society. We have found that the average person does not get fairness in a society where the bulk of the community was dispossessed. If you think about John Rawls says, social justice or justice generally is fairness to all. But what is fair in a society that we play a game that's called the rigged monopoly game. You get the blue team uh, and the pink team start at the same time. Then you withdraw the pink team and you let the blue team continue to play, having taken over the properties from the pink. Then you stop the game again and then you say, okay, now you're equal guys. And I've done this with my students and it was not funny <laughs> because uh, we then said now play and they made all of their arguments from all of the case law around uh, equality under the law and protection of the constitution, human rights, irrationality brought in administrative justice, etc. Society doesn't understand that, that if you then say later the pink team will come in and play, mathematically it's impossible that the pink team could ever catch up with mathematically. The worst part is because of the principle of exponentiality, is that actually the gap is going to widen. It's not going to, to be reduced. It's the same way as if you owe the bank and if you pay in, in little drops of money, eventually it, it's too big. It, it gets bigger, the, 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 the debt gets bigger. So that's the part that I think society needs to be educated, bit by bit. The Daily Maverick has a citizen maverick and they're doing, playing their part and use 24 occasionally plays their part. But I would say the Daily Maverick is the one that is dedicated to educating people about democracy because it's really hard. When I start with the students at Stanford University, they feel being asked to be part of a reparative process is unfair. My ancestors did this. Why must I now be impacted by reparative action as uh, required by law? And when we do these immersion processes, that's when they understand. And although I do it with a monopoly game, I, it wasn't. <coughs> I, I learned it from a colleague at Harvard who said she did it with a race law not with the Monopoly game, where a, an eight-year-old complained and said her father had complained that the government policies were unfair, they were favoring Latinos, women, people with disabilities, and black people, and it was unfair to him. And the teacher then said to the little one, tomorrow you must come wearing blue and, and pink. And then she would the pinks to run and as far as they could. And then, then after that, then she said, the blue can run. She told the kids that when I, when I blow the whistle the first time, the pinks should run. When I blow it for the second time, then the blues can join. And when the time came, the blues cried. No, the pinks, the pinks were the second team. They cried and she said, no, they must run. And, and of course, um, the fastest of the pinks which will catch up with the slowest. Just as Casta Semenya would probably catch up, or we finally could, could catch up, uh, or Oscar would catch up. But the pattern would always be unequal. So if eight-year-olds could understand it, we thought university students could understand it, and we played the monopoly game with them, and they get it. They get My it. last question before I open to literally a few questions from the floor, because otherwise we are going to be past our deadline moment. 
will be thrown out of here, which we don't want to occur. Um, what can Joe Citizen here in the UK, what can Joe Citizen in the various provinces of South Africa do personally? What, what's something small that we can do? We're not all lawyers. We can't do the law. But what can we do as individuals? Thank you. I think I should have addressed that, but I'm so grateful that you're asking that question. I think this, the first thing is do no harm. I mean, the greatest solution to bigotry, inequality, and all forms of injustices is just from your side. Make sure to the extent that you understand things, do no harm. The second thing, educate your peers. The, the foundation that I co-founded with my children will be doing do dinner conversations about democracy, I think in, in a couple of weeks, because that's where conversations happen. Mm -hmm. So you could have social justice conversations at dinner and educate people about what you know, but also caution people about bigotry. And, and don't be rude because people just recoil when you attack them. But I found that if you engage them just about the cost of debasement, here I'm not even talking about economic inequality, just, just generally bigoted behavior that neuroscientists have shown us that it actually harms people. Um, the, the brain cannot distinguish between being hit with a blunt object and being hit with de debasement. It has the same um, Physical trauma. and emotional impact. Exactly. And then um, Helene Opperman Lewis, who's written a book, she's Africana, and it's a very hard book. It says, Bre Apartheid, the bastard child of Britain. <laughs> she talks about displacement and what happened in the country, what happened between the Romans and the English, between the English and the Africans, between the Africans and everyone else. But she talks about what happened in the rest of the world. So I think just engage people politely and also for people to keep noticing uh, Judge Marshall, who's South African now works, was the Chief Justice of Massachusetts, said a lot of bigoted behavior is unconscious is when you really don't know you're being bigoted, mm -hmm. but you're just doing what you raised to do was normal. And I think Alexander Fenter, who's written a book on reconciliation and restitution, also talks about things he took for granted as a child because he was raised in a particular way. And it, it talks about something very interesting where his mom told him to give this black man a cup of tea or a, a tin of tea. And he, as a child, called this man, boy, come and take your tea, because um, that was the way it was. And he says he still remembers now how that man, although he said, donkey may bounce, but he could see that seething anger in him. And so it's like <coughs> When it comes to money, I'll just give you an example of Daniel Takis. Daniel Takis is nine years old, and she wrote a book, Lola the Spy, and she's donating 10 rand of each sale, 10 rand to Action for Inclusion, and 10 rand to um, Caring for Girls track from Mandela. Us, we climb mountains, but we also pay. Last year, I paid 27,000 rand for my own salary. This year, when I, I had a contract with a certain judge, we both were entitled to this money, to ourselves. We both earned 360,000. I donated all of mine to Asian Inclusion. But I'm not asking people to donate their entire contract money to Asian Inclusion. It's really... And then Temba is disappearing for different reasons. <laughs> and then Temba Soyisi, who was recognized by the Vice Chancellor, is a social justice ambassador. 2010, 21, he wrote a book and is donating the proceeds. It's 21 lessons. And he brought all he 
achievers according to him, <laughs> what he is. He's the vice chancellor here of him, uh, our chancellor, Edwin Cameron, and, and many other leaders, uh, Sandra Prince, no? just to talk about their stories. And so, but we also will be doing in Prof. Um, Edwin Cameron, uh, Judge Edwin Cameron and I will be hosting a, a fundraising date, a, a sort of a family, they call it a family dinner, I'm not quite sure. Uh, it's being organized between the students. Uh, so on that day, we'll be like Stockwell, we'll mm -hmm. invite, ask you to mm -hmm. invite some of your friends and they, they don't have to be Martis. Mm -hmm. Just <laughs> sit with them at home and then from, from wherever you're sitting, whatever you've collected should go into this. But we, we ask people not just to support the action for inclusion, we ask you to support bridging the gap which covers a whole lot of others, including hunger. Mm -hmm. Student hunger is a reality. And you can't study when you can't. You, you can't. can't. So we, anything that really bridges the gap, literally, and no amount is too little. No amount is too much. But we also ask you to support the MPLA by firstly being part of it, just maybe as an ending on, on, on why you should be part of it in person, just as problem is part of it in person. When we do a social justice walk, he's there. Uh, Karen Darren was with us there when we walked with the students. Um, there was a business person who was dragged to go and deliver wheelchairs that he had donated. And he, his friend dragged him literally to go to the village. This was in um, in Kenya, I can't remember that it was Kenya or Nigeria, and he went there just because he was doing a favor to the friend, and he had donated the wheelchair. And when the event had ended, one of the kids came and then grabbed his leg, and he asked the little kid, "What more can I do for you?" Thinking the kid was hanging onto his leg because there was something else, another favor the kid wanted from him. And the kid said, no, say, I don't want anything. I just want to see your face so that when I go to heaven, I can thank you again. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? And he says since then, he has realized that there is a personal reward to following them, your money when you do um, philanthropical work um, because when you just give the money you don't see the beauty of it and we've seen some of the students that have graduated some have sent notes to us but it doesn't matter even if we don't see them we know that they've graduated that on its own is beautiful investment doesn't only have a monetary return on investment exactly. sometimes that return on investment is what you gain as a human for what you did for others, there's the return is in the outcome. We've got time for literally one question. John, you've been writing furiously, <laughs> our daily magazine journalist. Really, thank you so much, and uh, huge respect for you that you've achieved. Um, for sharing. Can you speak up a little bit so the mic is <clears throat> Huge respect for everything that you have achieved and for sharing your uh, personal story today to, to a large extent as well as as well as the M plan, what is happening. Um, as you know, I'm a journalist, so you must expect a nice question from me. <laughs> um, but it is a nice question, actually. Um, so, unfortunately, this didn't happen at Stellenbosch University, it happened at another university in the north. But a <clears throat> lecturer friend of mine who lectures in negative uh, business school. Um, put to his, this happened in the last few weeks, he put to his students um, an option of the various forms of uh, the various systems of government, starting going right across the spectrum from liberal democracy through to constrained democracy, through to sort of benevolent authoritarianism, all the way to extreme um, autocratic government of North Korea, whatever. And he took us to sort of middle point Singapore, which is kind of a mix of uh, both constrained democracy and more authoritarian. 
kind of approach. And he asked the, it was 160 students over a two week period. And he asked them uh, which system they thought was the best for South Africa. Um, out of the 160, zero chose liberal democracy. Zero. These were middle ranking executives. Um, the, and of course, the Arab Church extreme authoritarianism. Um, Sixty percent chose a kind of middle way, what you'd call a constrained democracy, like Singapore, where you have authoritarian elements, but it's still a democratic system. I was completely shocked when I heard that. I thought I knew my country. I keep in touch with South Africa like three, four times a week. Um, but I was really shocked by that. So when you said there's 10 years, um, but there might not be time. Um, and I think your plan planning and everything is absolutely superb. But what does one do? And then you've got the target. Maybe it was warning about. Spring or was it Valencia? I'm never sure which one of them. Um, what can be done here and now in terms of obviously the politics have to change? Um, and I know that's not your field, you're, a, you're an academic, you're a professor, but something has to be done pretty urgently. If that's what 60% of middle ranking executives are saying, it reflects a degree of desperation. Which is really worrying. Thank you. Um, I'm not that shocked because with the tumor data, we're getting people who have decided they call themselves constitutional abolitionists. And it's gaining ground in that even a minister has joined them and a lot of it has to do with lack of constitutional literacy, which is uh, as part of this program, the, the M plan. That one on social co cohesion and social accountability includes uh, constitutional and legal literacy. Because people often think, for example, young people are apathetic about elections. The truth is they don't see it as meaningfully going to change anything but they do want things to change, and therefore then they're going to take their shortcuts to change things. Part of it is about constitutional literacy, but also what needs to happen is this constitutional change that is being proposed and needs to happen is so that more people can go to parliament and raise things. At One Young World, for example, I shared a platform with a 24-year-old parliamentarian who went there as an independent. But the first law he changed, um, I still remember his name, Juan Diego. I can't remember his name, he's from Panama. The first law he changed, he was able to change it from outside. Their constitution allows people to propose a law, not by a petition, just to table a law in parliament. But for me, a democracy was always about nothing about us, without us, and for us. And that's how it came about. Athenians were so angry with the let's deciding things that imposed burdens on everyone but favored them. And hence, then they studied the systems in Africa, we hear in, 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 in the various places they came up with the concept of democracy, but it was really about having everyone engaged. Um, and I think a lot of people are disengaged in our system. Firstly, we've got structural inefficiencies because of the past, but secondly, what instead of sorting out those structural inefficiencies, the elite favored themselves. One of the best cases, for example, on social justice that mentions social justice and that also says without the parity of action uh, in South Africa, you cannot have social justice. It was not a case for Joe Public. It was a case where parliamentarians passed a law to give themselves a pension. While TRC victims got 30,000 rand, parliamentarians, regardless of <coughs> had been in exile or not, 
you were given the special pension that was created for them. Same thing with BEE. So a lot of it, and I think business has to take responsibility old in that old business wanted to appease the elite and to create a buffer, which has worked internationally because when you have um, the big, I think it was Adam Smith who had said, you need a big middle class. You need something where you've got a small rich group, a small poor group, and then a, a, a bulging middle class. So, of course, if you then, you know, uh, strike deals with the middle class, if there's a bulging group, it's sort of okay because they're going to cater for some of the people down there. I'm not saying it's okay, but it works. But in a country where you have a huge pyramid and the majority of your people are down there, and then you lift a few people and you absorb them, it, firstly, the strategy of BDE did not encourage creating more, more economic vehicles, it encouraged buying into existing ones, which obviously then means um, less um, a true growth of the economy. Yes, it's, I mean, economists would say it's growing because there's business happening, but if you look at the book, um, uh, the Israeli book, Startup Nation, I mean, proper growth is when you grow more vehicles, which is, more, and you give more opportunities to people to start businesses. And at the Tuba Foundation, incidentally, we are suggesting the dragon style method as opposed to the way it's currently done. Dragon style. The dragon style or shark tank style, where instead of big business trying to absorb everyone, not everyone can get shares in Standard Vehicle Angler, but you can only have a few and you're leaving a lot of people behind, but also you're not growing the economy. So rather, when people encourage people, um, like, you know, the Kenyan little boy who started the washing machine, the automatic washing machine, Stephen Wamakota, so you've got kids like that in the township and in the villages that are creating that, big business should invest there. So in that way, you're expanding the economy, but you're not being left out because you're putting some shoes in there. But you then bring the two things, you're not only bringing money, you're also bringing the skills, which we've seen it working in schools under Partners for Possibility, where they link a teacher, a school, I mean, a principal who's got a struggling school with a successful business person. And of course, you, you, you have to teach them about mutual respect and about also understanding that just because he has a struggling school doesn't mean he's stupid. There are things he knows that he don't know. And it's been marvelous. I mean, the last time I checked, they fixed 1,500 schools. Amazing. So I think it's things like that, even under the action for, I mean, with the M plan, what we do need, and problem, I don't know, uh, problem is heading. The, the Council of Social Justice Champions that is leading the M plan. But we would love you to join because you can also say what can be done through the M plan to really give it life, to get people animated, to get people inside um, this vehicle instead of screaming outside and saying, destroy the constitution. When I personally think that constitution has all of the evils of change and it can drive change if properly used. But people have to be educated and so people have to be part of the deal, not just told do this, do that. At this point, I'm going to call it a, a close formal proceedings. Unless we're being asked to leave, please socialize, chat. Maybe have a chat. I know there's a lot of other questions in the room. <coughs> please just come and chat to Julie directly. But I think let's everyone else have an opportunity to start networking before we actually are asked to leave. So, Deva, I do apologize. If we could just handle questions directly with Julie. I know Deva has one. But thank you, everybody. Now enjoy having some time with each other. Thank you so much. Thank you.